message all in itself that uh, sometimes, you know, you look into the news, I don't know if you caught the news this morning, but there was another disaster that took place. Another terrorist attack. And it makes us get a glim view of the future until you meet young scholars like this. When you know that God has wonderful plans for us. Now, it's not always easy, in fact, as we're doing our snapshots uh, series here from the uh, life of Moses. Um, my clicker's not clicking, so there we go. Uh, as we're doing these snapshots, every week we just take a little snapshot in the life of Moses. I've been calling them like selfies along the way where uh, he's recording the story about himself. And we're just taking these little snapshots of his life. Today we're going to talk about needle lift. Uh, every now and then, things in your life don't go the way you had, had wished that they would, and, and you feel like you just need a lift. Well, my hero in the story here is Moses, and he is as discouraged as can be. God had raised him up for the time in which he was living, and he had called him, and when he called him, Moses stalled. He, he, he kind of refused, and five different excuses of why he couldn't do what God wanted him to do. And then he finally reluctantly conceded, I'll do it. And so uh, with this reluctant concession to go in before Pharaoh and say, let my people go, he finally goes into Pharaoh thinking, okay, now that I've done this, that God is going to move into action and things are going to go wonderfully because he's finally obeyed, but it actually got worse before it got better. Pharaoh said, I'm not letting your people go. I don't even know this Lord you're talking about. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make everything more difficult in your life. And so sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. None of us here can promise you as scholars that things are going to get easier this next semester than they were the last. In all likelihood, they will get a little more difficult. And circumstances might grow a little more weary. And you might get discouraged too. I don't know where the rest of you are in your, your life. Maybe at work, work's not going so well. It may get worse before it gets better. You might get discouraged. Maybe it's a relationship you have. Things are not well and they're not going well and they may just get worse before they get better. Moses is discouraged because things are not going as he had planned. And as a result of that, my, my hero here in his discouragement, this is what he says, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Here, you sent me to him, and things have gotten worse. Why, God? You read a little bit further. He says, ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people. Why are things getting worse? And the first thing we want to do is blame God. You have not rescued your people at all. I've been doing my part. Well, finally, after he conceded, after all this protesting, I, I finally obeyed, so now God jumped through my hoop, do it my way, and he says, you've not, you've not rescued your people at all. And we saw the last time that he just needs a lift. He's discouraged. Uh, he's doing the good and noble thing, and it's not going well, and he just needs a lift from God. And the Lord said to him, now you will see what I will do. Sometimes things get more difficult. You have an instructor you feel like just does not like you. <laughs> you have an assignment and you say, this is impossible. You have an employer, you know he doesn't like you. <laughs> he gives you all the hard things to do. You have a relationship where the person, everything you do to make it better, somehow they turn it to make it worse. And he needs a left. And God says, now that you're where you need to be, realizing you cannot do this, now watch what I will do. You see, Jesus said it this way. Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. We need the Lord. My, 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 my hero here, Moses, and he is one of my Bible heroes, uh, he says, uh, God goes on to say, because my mighty hand is going to now st 
start working things. And he said, my mighty hand is going to involve Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's going to finally, with a mighty hand, he's going to shove you out of there. It's not just he's going to let you go, he's going to shove you out, and you're going to go out with great fortune, because now you're on my plan, not your plan. And so as we look at this passage, I find that there's a threefold encouragement that Moses is given. And the first encouragement, and I want you to say it with me, I am the Lord. That's my first point. If I were making points here today, that's my first point. Now my second point is very similar, because a little bit further in the passage, he makes the second point. Say it with me. I am the Lord. Now, as we go down through the passage, he's going to make a final third point, and it's kind of like the second and the first point. So say it with me here. I am the Lord. Listen, when you need a lift, you need to first of all remember, the Lord is telling you, I am the Lord. Just remember who you are. It's not about you. It's all about him. And once you get your priorities straight, now things start to fall into place. Now, I notice that these three expressions, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, in this pericope of the Scripture, this section of Scripture here, that it, it starts there, it ends there, and it divides the section into two halves. And in those two halves, he says that he's going to make himself known, and then you will know. He uses these expressions about himself that I am the Lord, To say, I want you to know me. If you learn anything through your education process, the thing you need to learn and come to learn and really know is you don't know it all. (laughs) But the Lord does. And he has the solution to every single problem, every single challenge, every single difficulty. He has it. I am the Lord, and it's his goal. He says, I want, when you need a lift, you're really down, and you need a lift, he says, you need to acknowledge, first of all, who I am by what I have done. Past tense. You will know. Now, what has he done? If you read through the context there between the I, uh, I am the Lord and I am the Lord, you read through there, he's going to say, first of all, I appeared. This is awesome. God makes appearances. He came crashing into Moses' life in a burning bush. Later, he's going to come crashing into Moses' life on Mount Sinai. He's going to come down on the mountain. The finger of God is going to write the Ten Commandments. He comes crashing into the lives on the transfiguration. Jesus is transfigured before all of them. He comes crashing into their lives. I was just eight years old when God came crashing into my life. And I was at camp. And the speaker was speaking. And he did it through the Word of God as he was preaching the book. God crashed into my life and spoke to my heart that I needed Jesus. God revealed himself. Now, this revelation that he has here, he says, I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to, uh, as God Almighty. And all of this is ex- important expressions that he's making here. Uh, I did this as God Almighty, El Shaddai. He says, when I appeared to Abraham, he was 99 years old. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me. Notice who appeared before him, El Shaddai, but in the text it says it was the Lord. The Lord, that is Yahweh, Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, L-O-R-D, Y-H-W-H. He appeared, but he appeared to him and said, he didn't say I'm the Lord, he said I am God Almighty. Moses is learning from God that sometimes God conceals some things about himself. He says that to Abram, he did not reveal himself as Yahweh. It was Yahweh who appeared to him, but Yahweh said to him, I am God Almighty. He said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to him as I did to you. Kind of like to Moses, he didn't make himself known by the name of Jesus, but he had made himself known by the name of Yahweh. But to Abraham, it was only El Shaddai. He's saying, listen, some things are concealed. There's a verse tucked away in the book of Deuteronomy, 29.29, it says, the things that are revealed are revealed to you and your children forever, but the things that are concealed belong to the Lord. God is not going to let you know everything. 
you can't handle it. You are not omniscient. None of us will know everything, not even in our area of subject and expertise, we won't know it all. But the Lord knows everything. Not only does he reveal, but he conceals, he holds back. He reveals just what we need to know. No more, no less, nothing else. He said, now I want you to, I want you to have a lift because God has made promises in the past. He has covenanted with his people, especially with Abraham. He said, I also established a covenant with them and gave them the land of Canaan. If you go back to Genesis 15, Moses was met by God and God entered into a, a covenant agreement. He said to Moses, you're going to be in a foreign country for 400 years. Turned out to be 430 years. And he said, while you're in that foreign country of Egypt, he said there, you're going to come back to this land, and I'm promising this land to you. Listen, we're going to enter into a second millennial B.C. covenant or treaty arrangement, and this is how it works. We're going to sacrifice animals and split them, half on one side, half on the other. And then I'm going to pass through, and you're going to pass through, and as we pass through, we are entering a binding arrangement, agreement, a covenant that if I do not fulfill the terms and conditions of this covenant, I am to die like these animals stretched out on the ground all dead. It's a blood covenant. A blood covenant. Well, when it came time to pass through the pieces, because Abraham slaughtered them, laid them all out, God caused a sleep to fall on Abraham. There he is, he's snoring away. Bible says God passed through the pieces and the way he passed through there was this blazing torch of fire a fiery furnace of, of, of God is a consuming fire and he passed through the pieces indicating indicating this was a one side promise God said I'm going to give you this land Abraham 400 years from now your descendants are going to come back and you're going to have this land this is going to be your land and he says, a one-sided promise that I'm making. You didn't enter it, only I entered it. And if I do not fulfill my promise, you're to split me in half. Wait, wait a second, God, split you in half? You're to kill me like these animals? I mean, God kill you? What God is doing is giving what we call an unconditional, unilateral covenant. No strings attached. He just promises to Abraham, I'm going to do this. The beautiful part of all of this is there's a New Testament, a new covenant. We call it New Testament. It's really a new covenant. And the new covenant, we celebrate the, the Lord's Supper. You know, this cup is the new covenant. There's a new covenant. It's the same thing. It's a blood covenant. It's of everlasting life. All who receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord enter into a covenant. The thing is, Jesus has already done everything for the covenant. I can't add a thing to it. I just accept his terms of the covenant. I believe and make him my Savior and Lord. He has done everything. And once I do that, I'm in covenant relationship with him. It's called everlasting life. That's what I get. Everlasting pardon and forgiveness. He's my everlasting God. I'm forever his child. That's why it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when you're in those nights and you're studying and you're cramming like crazy and you think nobody cares and nobody's around, nobody knows how bad I got it, he has never left you nor forsaken you. When you're in that relationship with a son or a daughter or a parent or someone and, and they're just making everything terrible and you say, nobody understands. Yes, he said, I've never left you nor forsaken you. I'm right there with you along the way. I don't care what it is. God has entered into that covenant. Now, as I go on in this passage, God says to him, listen, this, I want you to be lifted up because of what I have done. Remember, remember, I have remembered you. Moreover, I've heard your groaning <laughs> over that test, over that prof, over, the, you know, over whatever it is. I've heard that. In this case, it was the Israelites. It was the Egyptians who were, uh, are, were enslaving them. And he says, and I have remembered. Sometimes we do feel forgotten. Never forgotten. It's just not usually God's time yet. He said there's still more, you know, sometimes I'm really glad when I get to the bottom of the pit because then there's only one way to go and that is up. 
And sometimes we got to go just a little further before we can be lifted a little higher. He says, remember who I am. Now, when you really need a lift, you need to acknowledge who I am by what I have done. I've done all these things. I reveal myself. I conceal myself. He's done all these things. But he said, uh, you also need to acknowledge who I am by what I will do. I will do this. Now, as Moses is writing this, this is not history. It hasn't happened yet. He's saying, I will deliver you. I will rescue you. I will pull you out of Egypt. I am going to do a great work. He says, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This is almost prophetic for Moses because a few chapters later in the book of Exodus, we'll see he's going to lead the land of Egypt through the parting of the Red Sea, a great miracle, and he's going to go through on dry ground. He says, I will rescue you. The Bible from the third chapter on is a book of salvation. In the third chapter, sin entered into the human race, and so everybody has been born into a, a sin-cursed world, and God is in the business of rescuing. I don't care where you're at, what's your situation, how you're, you're backed up against the wall, if you will call on the Lord, I will deliver you. I will deliver you. The next thing that I notice in this passage is, I will free you. He said, I will free you. You're going to be free from the bondage. You're going to be free from that which was holding you back, that which was holding you down, that which was oppressing you. I will free you. He goes on to say, I will redeem you. Now, the word redeem means to purchase, to buy. He said, I will buy you. I will pay the price. We live on the other side of all of this. In fact, we live on the other side of the cross, and the price has already been paid. In the original Passover, they just spread, they shed the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost, side post, and the death angel passed over them. They were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And the New Testament says Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so he, he's the one who purchased us. He fully paid the price so that we could be free. He said, I will receive you. Later, he's going to actually come down and, and dwell in, in a, a temple, which is actually there, a tent, a tabernacle, a, a tent. He's going to make his presence known in the midst of his people. He said, I will receive you, and you will be my own people. In the New Testament, it says, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the moment that I receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord, he invades my body, and he is with me. I am his people. If you know Jesus, you are his people. I go a little bit further in the passage, and he says this. Know who I am by what I will do. I will lord you. I will lord it over you. I will be your God. More than anything, he wants to be your God. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to receive your worship. He wants you to follow him, follow his ways, live for him. He says, by who I am. He also said, I will lead you. It was very interesting that there was this pillar of cloud that, that led them through the wilderness. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And wherever that pillar went, they followed. When it stopped, they stopped. When it stayed there a day, they put the tabernacle up underneath it because God was in their midst. When that pillar moved off of the tabernacle, they knew it was time to leave. God will lead you. We're to be encouraged by this. We're to be encouraged that God, he said, I will bring you to the land. He says, listen, I have a place for you. I have a destiny for you. And I am the one who is going to give you that. I will lead you there. I will take you there. I will bring you to the land that I swore to you. This passage began... With I am the Lord, I'll make myself known. I am the Lord, then you will know. I am the Lord. The passage ends exactly where it began. When you need a lift, you need the Lord. And that's my final question. What do we take away from this whole passage? The thing that we take away from this passage is when we need a lift, we do know where to go. We know where to go. We need to go to the Lord to the Lord. That's where we need to go. We just go to the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very thankful for the book of Exodus, the things that it does share for us. And we thank thankful, Lord, for these scholars here. And we pray, Father, 
uh, that they will, in the future, when times get a little tough in their uh, studies and in their pursuits, that they will know that uh, they go to you, you will provide help. You will grant the deliverance. And that you will be the one who will actually be there with them and encourage them more than anyone else. And you'll bring other people into their lives because none of us were, were meant to live in a vacuum, but as a community. And Lord, uh, they will know that there is a people here at Bethany who care. Care enough to support them, not just financially, but in our prayers. Lord, we pray for others who are here. Perhaps they need a lift today. At work, at home, in a relationship, financially, physically. Lord, we know it's to you that we must go. And that you're the one who will hear. You will answer our prayer. Hear us today, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.